Peace. What's up, YouTube? This is Draw Ya. I made a video several months ago about the hidden history of Scotland, and it has got gained quite a few attraction uh, in the last few weeks. And I, I've been trying to make a part two of that video for some time now. I just have images that I want to incorporate into that PowerPoint, and I'm still waiting on those images to come and to the, the degree that I want to present it. But in the meantime, there is a part of it that I do want to put out now because I've been seeing comments under the video and uh, a lot of skeptics are kind of questioning if this is really accurate. And I just want to say that it is very accurate. And I think the one misconception that we have to recognize is that when we think of Europe or European, we always associate that with Caucasian. And when you understand real history, you understand that the European history is very more complex and convoluted than just what we hear in our history studies. The original people of Europe, the original monarchies were actually so-called black people. And that's the reason why I say so-called black people because the people that we call quote unquote black here in the Americas, the Caribbean, South America, Central America, they weren't all came, they didn't all come from West Africa or Central Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. Some of them were originally here as aboriginals. Some of them came from the West Coast of Africa, and some of them came as migrants, immigrants, refugees from Europe, especially in the British Isles. And this is what we're going to get to right now with the Scottish heritage that a lot of our people have, and they just don't under, they don't know. And this is a video that is going to really summarize what happened to Scotland in the late 1700s, mid 1700s, late 1700s, and how many of them came into the new world. There's an uh, event that's not really talked about called the Highland Clearances. I re reference this a lot. Uh, and this was a big upheaval of Scottish people who were displaced from their, their land and they were displaced into the new world. But I'm gonna let this video talk about this and then I'm gonna chime in and then we're gonna talk about some other things. This area of Scotland called the Highlands relative to the rest of Scotland is very sparsely populated. In the mid-18th century, about 30% of Scots lived there. By the turn of the 20th, it was about 8%. So what happened? Well, the Highland clearances happened. So to give a bit of background, the early 18th century had seen a series of rebellions against British rule in Scotland in what are called the Jacobite rebellions. These were where numerous Scottish clans, many of whom lived in the Highlands, maintained their loyalty to the House of Stuart, who had previously ruled England, Scotland and Ireland until they got a bit too Catholic, which led to their deposition in the Glorious Revolution in 1688. And many in Scotland refused to acknowledge the new House of Orange and its successors and saw them as illegitimate rulers. When Scotland merged with England in 1707, its crowns merged too, and the Scottish clans took matters into their own hands. These rebellions were routinely defeated by the ever more professional British army, and the government could see that there was only one way to prevent future uprisings, break the clan system. And the first... First, let me just summarize what he just said. So when we all know King James, uh, we all recognize the King James Bible when it was authorized in 1611. King James was, uh, I believe in England, he was King James I, in Scotland, he was King James IV. Um, and he uh, unified Scotland, Wales, Britain, and Ireland. And uh, that was the unification of the, of the, the British monarchy. Um, and he was a Protestant. His son or his grandson became Catholic. And as you know about the history of British, the, uh, the British went to war or they had, um, conflicts with the Catholic Church. So it was a, a big contention when the House of Stuart, who was, uh, that was like Henry VIII and, you know, uh, that lineage, the Tudor dynasty, that's King James's dynasty, they started becoming, uh, when his grandson become, or his son or grandson became more Catholic, it was uh, kind of like a big shock. It was, it was kind of a, a big uh, uh, issue with them because Henry VIII, you know, he converted to Protestantism, he was a Catholic to, so he could divorce his wife. But that's you know a, a video for another day. But that's what uh, the issue was with Britain. They didn't like that it was becoming more Catholic. And a lot of Scottish people, they were, uh, they uh, followed the line of the, uh, the line of Stuart, even though uh, they had been more Catholic, but the British, they wanted to stay a more Protestant state. So they had issues with the Scottish who were backing up the uh, the line of Stuart when they displaced them out of the country.
and they, uh, the Scottish, they, they thought that was, um, that they were actually uh, disobeying like God's rule that, you know, he wanted this line to rule in Britain. So they were in line with keeping them in the house, but the British, they were fighting. They're like, no, we're not doing, going to do that. So that's what caused a lot of contention. The best way they could do this was by punishing the lords who had rebelled by depriving them of their lands and giving them to loyal subjects. These subjects, while most of them were Scottish, spent the majority of their time in London and over the generations they had less and less in common with their ancestral homeland, which is where economic developments come in. At this point, Britain was in the initial stages of the Industrial Revolution, which saw a greater number of people move to towns and cities for work. These people needed to be fed, and so farmlands were transformed to become more efficient. Thus, the Lords of the Highlands endeavoured to make their lands more economically valuable by turning them into massive sheep farms because money. The problem was that people already lived there and farmed it for themselves, and legally, the land was theirs in common. But this problem was quickly solved by changing the law. And so began the Highland Clearances, whereby men and soldiers under the command of the nobility could forcibly evict people from their homes. And to stop them from returning, their houses would be burned down. And over the course of a century, over 100,000 people were left homeless and destitute. Now, So that's big. 100,000 people were destitute from their homes. They were basically homeless. 100,000. Now we're going to talk about where they go. There's a commonly held idea that the clearances were undertaken mostly by English lords, but this isn't true. The majority were Scottish, but the worst offender was an Englishman, hence the belief. This man was the Duke of Sutherland, although at this point he was only a Marquis, like some sort of a peasant. And his eviction shouldn't be seen as just economic dislocation. This was the focused and near-absolute obliteration of a lifestyle and culture which had existed since before records began. So what happened to these dispossessed people? Well, they were simply left to their own devices and they didn't have many choices. For many, the only alternative was emigration, and so they headed for the New World, often the United States and Canada, but many went to Australia and New Zealand too. But how could they afford the gym? And also, some of them went to the Caribbean islands, like Jamaica. Journey there if they were left penniless. Well, their choice was simple, potential starvation or indentured servitude. And I want to highlight that because when the Scottish, they were clear from Scotland, they weren't rich. So the idea that they came to the Americas or they came to Jamaica and then they had slaves and just named their slaves after them, that's erroneous because they couldn't afford slaves. They were slaves themselves. They were in servitude. So you couldn't afford slaves. So how can you say your last name came from your slave owner when these people, they were displaced, they were working as servants, you see? In the end, the highlands were left sparsely populated, and even the sheep which replaced the people also disappeared, because the farms there weren't able to compete with the lamb and wool industries from New Zealand, many of whom's farmers were, ironically, the descendants of those who were cleared from the highlands. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and thank you for watching, with a special thanks to my patrons, James Bizonet, John... All right. So that was a good summary of what the Highland Clearance is. This is an article I want to talk about. The Highland Clearance's outrage or inevitable progress. Was the Highland Clearance ethnic cleansing or did the landlords really think it was a, a done? Was it done for the good of the locals? Still an emotional topic in the Highlands today. Let's read a little bit about this. The Highland Clearances sometimes in Scottish, Scotland's history just referred to as the Clearances were a period of huge social upheaval throughout the Highlands of Scotland. Some commentators interpret the evictions that took place as a form of ethnic cleansing. Other historians see the uprooting of the native population as inevitable, given the changing economic and political climate in the North that gained momentum towards the end of the 18th century. So that's the 1700s. The change and disruption to the Highland communities and the creation of the emptiness we associate today with large tracts of the Highlands took place as landowners found new ways of making money from their land. The necessitated resettlement of tenants cultivating communal land. The native people with their Gaelic culture firmly Im Im embedded in the places where they had lived for generations, had little say in the new re regime. They were either forced to move to Scotland cities to find work, to immigrate and start again in the new world, or they were sometimes allocated coastal marginal land. This was in order to clear the inland grazings for the estate's owner's sheep at the time regarded as profitable and innovative in farming terms. The new coastal settlements were intended to be sustainable through fishing and kelp gathering. The kelp or seaweed was processed and used in chemical and soap making industries. When these activities proved to be unsustainable, a further wave of immigration followed on. So the just talking about how they were 
cleared in the, in the late 1700s and a lot of them moved to the new world a lot of them settled in other coastal lands but even with that those who settled in the coastal lands they weren't able to afford money or make money and afford a living so they eventually even them that stayed in the coastal lands they actually had to immigrate as well so a dance called america some of the immigration was voluntary a circumstance remarked upon by james boswell touring scotland with the english lexicographer Samuel Johnson, 1773. On Sky, for example, he records in his journal, we perform with much activity, a dance, which I suppose the immigration from Sky has occasioned, they call it America. Each of the couple after the comet, evolutions and evolutions successfully whirls round in a circle till all are in motion and the dance seems intended to show how immigration catches till the whole neighborhood is set afloat the Highland Clearances and Don Robin uh, Castle, aside from voluntary immigration and not all Highland landlords were tyrants, many episodes of the Highland Clearances were carried out with much brutality. For example, the forced removal of tenants irrespective of age or infirmity and the burning of their townships. The Strath of uh, Cadonan is one of such notorious places where between 1813 and 1819, the entire glen was cleared in the name of the Sutherlands of Donnarobin Castle. At the time, they owned most of the country of Sutherland. Kildonan in Canada was where some of the Highlanders eventually settled. Hemsdale at the coastal end of the Strath grew from a planned village in 1814. And any tour of these Northlands, it was worth taking a short walk from the roadside down to the side of Clarence Village and Badea, north of Hemsdale. It was cleared by, it was settled by cleared Highlanders from the neighboring Straths. They were forced to build new homes here. It is said their young children had to be tethered in case they stayed uh, or they strayed near the cliffs. All right. All right, I think that's about it that I wanted to talk about. Talk about some of them moved to New Zealand. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, Okay, cool. So I just want to put on the article how a lot of the clearances, they were still kind of controversial in regards to they said this was like an ethnic cleansing. Now, you know, what ethnic cleansing was just when you're trying to remove a certain population from this area. And like I said, the theme is that the Highland Scots were so-called black people. All right, this is another article from the BBC. I think it came out in 2019, I think, around that time. Uh, 2020. Uh, talk about the uh, surprising origin of fried chicken. Now we know <laughs> who likes to eat a lot of, you know, fried chicken. It's the stereotypes, but you know, so-called black people eat a lot of fried chicken. But let's see about the origin of where fried chicken comes from. Fried chicken is em uh, emblematic of the U.S. South as collard greens and sweet potato pie, but it may be more Scottish than Southern. Let me zoom in a little bit in a way that somebody else converts to Judaism or become a uh, hair Krishna, I belong to the Church of Fried Chicken. When Top Chef co-host and uh, cookbook author Padma Lakshmi uttered these, those words, she spoke a divine truth. People all around the world are getting religion, quote unquote, with fried chicken and devoted flocks grow every day. All right, I'm gonna uh, skip down a little bit to the article we're talking about to, um, until World War II, fried chicken in the U.S. considered a food for special occasion. It later transitioned to something that people ate for breakfast or dinner or a couple of times a week. And these days, it's become widely available that people eat it whenever the mood strikes. Uh, where is it? Some other stuff in here. Uh, despite the fact that many cultures around the world make instinct varieties of fried chicken, the U.S. South version is it's unquestionably the most iconic, but why? What gives people in the Southern US the gumption to claim fried chicken as their birthright or their state religion, quote unquote, as Damon Lee Fowler wrote in 1998 book, Fried Chicken, the world's best recipes from Memphis to Milan, from Buffalo to Bangkok. The simple answer is that fried chicken's history, or fried chicken's early history is something of a mystery of US Southerners where its loudest and best cheerleaders helping to spread it across the US and later the world. The Scottish may have brought the method with them when they settled the American South. From the 17th to 19th centuries, conventional wisdom designated the American South as fried chicken's native habitat. Southerners made it a centerpiece of their 
regional cuisine and boasted that only African Americans, mostly enslaved, could make authentic fried chicken, quote unquote authentic. And when they say mostly enslaved, because they understand that all so-called black people, they weren't enslaved. That's just the, that's the historical narrative that all quote unquote black people were, came from slaves. They, people who know the real history, they understand that slavery has more nuance. There were so-called black people who owned slaves. There were so-called uh, white people who were in slavery or in bondage, especially, especially in the early 1700s, 1600s, the, um, the institution of, of American slavery being a quote unquote, just all black didn't become a, a real, uh, just a racial designation for black people until the late 1700s, early 1800s. All right, because you can read about that. There's a guy named, um, oh man, what's his name? Is it John Brown? No, it's not John Brown. It's, uh, oh man, his name escapes me. Uh, I remember, I'll, I'll come back to it. But some uh, culinary experts link some expertise to West Africa where for several centuries prior to European contact, local populations ate chicken and deep fried their food. However, West Africans didn't make fried chicken the same way many Southerners traditionally did. It was more like uh, fricasse, which uh, where chicken was lightly fried and then braised for a much longer time and seasoned sauce. Similar to Senegalese chicken yasa, since West African culinary traditions remain a mystery to so many, some saw the building blocks for fried chicken and leapt to a wrong conclusion. The US widely, first widely accepted printed Recipe for fried chicken appeared in 1824 in the first regional American cookbook, The Virginia Housewife, authored by Mary Randolph, a white woman from a slave holding family and the distant relative to Thomas Jefferson. Cut them up as for fricasse, dredge them with flour, sprinkle them with salt, put them in good quality of boiling lard and fried them a light brown, she, uh, she wrote. Of course, the dish is history starts much earlier, but this recipe set the fried chicken standard for generation of Southern cooks. For a century, fried chicken pure Southern heritage remained unchallenged until a food writer, John F. Mariani, wrote the following Encyclopedia of American Food and Drink, first published in 18, 1983. Almost every country has its own version of fried chicken from Vietnam's gajo to Italy's pollo frito to Austria's Weiner Abakhenda but he uh, continued the Scottish who enjoyed frying their chicken rather than boiling or baking them as the English did, may have brought the method with them when they settled the American South. Wait a minute, a quintessential, uh, a quint a quintessential, <laughs> sorry, a quintessential American uh, food might actually be Scottish? <laughs> well, wait a minute, a quintessential American food might actually be Scottish? Mariani raised an intriguing possibility, but unfortunately he didn't offer any proof for his, me for his musings. Still, there are some clues to support Scottish origin theory. All right, uh, though Randolph's recipe helped popularize fried chicken for Southern white cooks, an, old, an even older recipe uh, appearing in uh, 1784 or 1780, uh, 1747 British cookbook, The Art of Cookery, made plain and easy, may have pioneered it, only is not actually called fried chicken, simply titled to marinate chicken, chickens. Uh, the technique is all too familiar to today's Southern U.S. cooks. Uh, cut to they just talking about how to fry the chicken. I'm trying to get to the main thing. Uh, okay, let's just go right here. Uh, yeah, though authored by an English woman, Hannah Glass, and published in Dublin, Dublin, the cookbook incorporated a broad range of traditional British recipes. What's more, an essay in 18th century Scottish cuisine, Stana uh, Nananik, professor of social and cultural history at the University of Edinburgh, points out that 1773 biographer James Boswell wrote a diary uh, entry explicitly describing fried chicken during that an elderly taxman served him at court Shah Achan on the Isle of Skye. Um, Mariani's theories then is that as hundreds of thousands of Scottish and Scott Irish settlers immigrated to the Southern US colonies during the 1700s, they brought their tradition of fried chickens and fat with them. Now we know what happened in the 1700s. That was just when the Scott Highland clearances happened. 
a likely, a likely scenario is that at some point between the 17th and 19th centuries, enslaved African Americans began cooking fried chicken based on the recipes provided by Scottish slave holders. See, that's just the narrative. See, that's why when you read history, you have to understand it from truth because they always spin the narrative that so-called black people came from slavery. They don't really tell you where they come from. So if you believe the narrative that all black people, quote unquote, black people came from slavery, then you're going to just assume like, oh, they must have got this from their, their slave owners who were Scottish. But when you understand how the Scottish even got to America, you understand that they were the indentured servants that they're talking about. So in time, African-American cooks embraced it as part of their own culinary tradition with years of hone experience as well as adeptness as seasoning and frying. frying African-American cooks caused fried chicken to lose its Scottish identity and it became quintessentially Southern as black eyed peas, cornbread, collard greens, macaroni and cheese, and sweet potato pie. Now tell me this. So fried chicken, it even it's even cooked and it's still seen as like a cuisine in quote unquote black culture today. Why don't modern day Scottish people fry their chicken and eat fried chicken like, like so-called black people do, like we do? You gotta ask these types of questions. Like how do people just lose their their culture of food just over time like they're just like oh you know this is important for our culture but now we're just going to give it to the to the to the american black slaves and we're just going to not do it anymore that doesn't even make sense that doesn't make sense how can so-called black people still carry on traditions from 200 250 years ago but the scottish people who actually invented it is quote unquote are so-called scottish people they didn't do it like they stopped doing it that doesn't make sense that's why you got to question the history of when they just put it in your face like that all right. So I just wanted this is a good article, man, if y'all want to finish it up, because I don't want to make this video too long. But when you Google Scottish last names, common Scottish last names, it's the top most common surnames. And this is a simple Google search. It says right here, Scottish top 10 most common surnames. You got Smith with over 2000, Brown, Wilson, Robertson, Campbell, Stewart, Thompson, Anderson. Now, I'm sorry. These, I've met so many so-called black people with these last names. Don't forget about Scott as well. So I'm just saying, these names are not from your slave owners. These are most likely your actual ancestors, real last names who immigrated from Scotland. They were the, the immigrants from the Scotland clearances. All right, this is the last article I got. This is uh, an article that came out uh, on ABC or NBC uh, is the Washington, the blackest name in America. 2000 US census counted 163,036 people with the surname Washington. 90% of them were African-American. 90% of American, uh, so-called African-American Americans had Washington as their last name. Now, I just, I've never met a so-called white man with the last name Washington. I've never had it. All the people I've met with Washington were, uh, were black people. <laughs> but I, I want to read this whole article. I really just want to get to one part. Uh, because, you know, people say they came from, you know, their slaves. Let's just read this real quick. George Washington, his great grandfather, John, arrived in Virginia from England in 1656. John married the daughter of a wealthy man, eventually owned more than 5,000 acres, according to a new biography, Washington the Life by Ron Chernow. Along with the land, George inherited 10 human beings from his father. He gained more through his marriage to a wealthy widow and purchased still more enslaved blacks to work the lands he aggressively amassed. But over the decades, as he recognized slavery's contradiction with the freedom to a new nation, Washington grew opposed to human bondage. Yet slaves were the basis of his fortune. He would not part with them, Chernow said in the interview. Washington was not, harsh, uh, was not a harsh slave owner by the standards of the time. He provided good food and medical care. He recognized marriages and refused to sell off individual family members. Later in life, he resolved not to purchase any more black people. But he also worked his slaves quite hard under the difficult conditions. As president, he shut down or he shut them between his Philadelphia residence, Virginia estate to evade a law that freed any slave residing in Pennsylvania for six months. Uh, and many free bags. In his final years of Mount Vernon plantation, Washington said that Nothing but the rooting out the slavery can perpetuate the existence of our union. This led to extraordinary instructions and in its will that 124 of his slaves should be freed after the death of his wife. All right. 
right here. This is what I want to get at right here. Uh, 12 American presidents were slave owners of, uh, uh, of the eight presidents who owned slaves while in office. Washington is the only one who set all of them free. It's a myth that most enslaved blacks bore the last name of their owner. Only a handful of George Washington's hundreds of slaves did. For example, he recorded most of having just a first name, says Mary Thompson, the historian at Mount Vernon. Still, historian Henry Weinsett says many enslaved blacks had surnames that were unrecorded or were kept secret. So this is this is what the truth is about. They the narrative is that that all black people, so-called black people, got their last names from slavery, but that's a myth. And that's why it's like they just they they put out lies to make so-called black people believe that they just have no history. And they do that purposely because if you believe that you your last name came from a slave owner who was a Caucasian man, you almost in, instinctively or intrinsically believe that this white that white man the white man is basically like your pseudo patriarchal figure. He's like a father figure. So he's always going to be linked to your past. So in order for you to gain some type of completeness or wholeness, you're always going to look at the Caucasian as a for validation. That's this very psychological warfare that was being placed when they talk about our history. And that's why when I make this video about the hidden history between Scotland and Jamaica, really about Scotland and many so-called black people in the in the new world or the Western hemisphere, we have to understand how to break these psychological chains and understand what's real. All right. Because um, there's a the word uh, Scott, if you look it up, actually, let's just do that right now. Scott etymology. All right. So Scott etymology, when you read about it, it was Old English Scottas, plural inhabitants of Ireland and Irishmen from a, a late Latin Scotty, uh, circa 400, a name of uncertain origin, perhaps from Celtic, but answering to no known tribal name, Irish Scots appeared to be a Latin borrowing because when the Romans, when they conquered that land in the British Isles, they just named those people Celts and like uh, uh, Gauls and uh, Scots. So they just named those people. That was a, a name that was given to them. That's not what they called them. But, you know, as the saying goes, history is written by the conqueror. So the conqueror, so the people who are called Scots today, uh, that's just the name that they were given by the, you know, by the Romans who spoke Latin, but it says the uncertain origin. Now I have a, I have a theory that uh, Scott actually comes from the Greek. I mean, I can't, I can't prove it, but you know, like a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, scholars, they don't prove a lot of their stuff either. They just make speculation. So I'm just making a speculation as well. But in my opinion, I think this is where we get uh, the word Scott. And actually, let me, let's go on to the blue letter Bible. Trust me, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. <laughs> if y'all watch into this part of the video, man, y'all some real ones. All right. So this right here is Mark, uh, I think chapter six. Yeah, chapter six. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm tripping. It's Matthew chapter six. Hold on. Yeah, Matthew chapter 6, verse 23, where it talks about, yeah, but if thy eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. And if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is darkness. Now we know a lot of Latin comes from the Greek, right? So when we read the Greek, this word right here, Scotinos. Strong's G, 4652, Scotinos. Scotinos. Scottinos. And then we read the root word of that word, Scottos. Strong's G, 4655, Scottos. 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 And when you see the definition of that, it means darkness, darkness. Metaphor, uh, ignorance or respecting divine things, human duties, and coming in godliness and morality. A person in darkness becomes visible and holds away. But literally darkness so in a sense when you look up the history in the latin in the roman empire when they saw these people and it's like they're called scots 
it was almost like a mockery term, like, oh, you know, just like how people mock dark skinned people. They say, oh, you're a darkie the same way. It's, that's why I say it's not much that that doesn't get repeated in history, man. History is just a recycling of of the same story and just in different languages, man. So that's why I, I my my theory is that this is where Scott comes from is from this word skotos from coming darkness because when they saw the people they were dark skinned people, and that makes sense with when we look at the history of how so many of our people have these Scottish last names. All right, so that's all I got. Um, I hopefully somebody. <laughs> got some information of it i mean you know let me know what y'all think am i just talking mess you know because <laughs> a lot of people think i'm just lying so whatever uh but like i said i'm just trying to share some light on some information that i think is hidden and i think it's important that we really get into true history so we can really break to some of these chains and you know what this channel is all about breaking generational curses all right man so peace